Hi everyone, how's it going? Team here and this is BXJS Weekly, a JavaScript news podcast bringing you all the best news of the week and my microphone is probably a bit too high, let me move it closer. So welcome, this is episode number 13 from uh, June 2nd and we got a bunch of uh, pretty cool stuff today. Hey Mikkel, welcome to the stream. Right, so we got, um, if you didn't know, we have the JSConf in Europe this week. I think it's actually 2nd and 3rd June, so right now it's happening in Berlin. So there is going to be a lot of things uh, that was pre-announced for it, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot more things next week, but uh, let's just get started with what we have uh, this week around, right? So we got quite a lot of articles here some releases and a ton of new um, libraries and demos that was released for JSConf, as I said. As usual, you can find all of the links that I mentioned on GitHub under buildingxwithjs slash bxjs minus weekly. Uh, the link should be in the description uh, on YouTube if you're watching this on there. And if I, um, bleh, let me try that again. The link should be in the description on the Twitch channel and on YouTube if you're watching the video on the YouTube, right? Let's just get started. That is too hard for me to say. <laughs> All right, the first article we got here is called Simplify Web Worker Code with Comlink. So um, we all know that web workers are pretty neat, right? They allow you to offload the uh, your code, your logic essentially into another thread, but uh, they might be a bit of a pain in the ass to actually communicate with, right? Because typically you have this main thread, you have the worker thread, and you have to use the post message, which allows you to pass some sort of a messages between the worker and the main thread. And essentially, every time you write your own worker, you have to set up the sort of self written RPC calls, I guess, right? So it's, it's kind of annoying, right? So you have to use post message, and you have to figure out what's the action, what's the payload, and, you know, some sort of a format, execute that, every time setting this up is not so nice, right? So the uh, Comlink library, which I believe is actually from uh, Google guys, if I remember correctly, there should be a link somewhere here. Where is the link to the library itself? There it is. I think it's a Google project. Yes, Google Chrome Labs, exactly. So what the Comlink does is essentially allows you to expose methods from the worker in a very simple way, right? You import the Comlink global script inside of the worker, you write the service thing, and then you just expose it using the Comlink class. That's it, done. And then when you instantiate the worker, you wrap it in a Comlink proxy, and, all, and then uh, to call the methods, you just do await service and then your method name, which is really, really cool. So if you are working with the service workers, and if you're looking for a better way to set them up and better way to do the remote procedure calls, then have a look at this library. It seems to be really, really cool. And again, you know, it's Google guys, so it's most likely covered in tests, documented like good docs and everything. Those guys know how to write libraries. All right, continuing. We got a article called learn some useful JavaScript tricks with 30 seconds of code. So this is, um, I guess it's more of an announcement actually than an article. It's an announcement of a project called 30 seconds of code, as you might imagine which basically gives you a bunch of tasks that you can go through and uh, figure out, you know, how to do something in 30 seconds of code. And if you're interested in expanding your JavaScript lexicon, let's call it this way, do check the project out. It seems to be pretty neat. And, you know, maybe you just want some refreshers. That's also a good idea to have a look at. Right, continuing, we got an article called Getting Started with Ripple, XRP, meaning the um, crypto cryptocurrency, and Node.js, um, cryptocurrency. Why am I pronouncing it crypto? That is not correct. Wait. All right, so this is essentially a tutorial on how to use Ripple from Node.js Worlds. Uh, if you're not familiar with Ripple, it is a cryptocurrency um, that is one of the trending ones right now. Like I'm, I'm quite far away from the cryptocurrencies world, but this seems to be like, seems to have some uh, interesting things built on top of it. So if you did know cryptocurrencies are not just, uh, you know, some sort of a money, but that actually, like, like that is not the primary point of the, um, I forgot the word, God damn it. Tell me like, what is, how do you call that thing? Distributed ledger. Um, Oh my God, why am I so, why am I like this? What do you call it? You got the Bitcoin? Blockchain, thank you very much. That was, that's the word that I was looking for. So blockchain, 
is actually an amazing technology, right? So if you go ahead and read the original white paper uh, on the blockchain, it is fascinating, right? So you get the distributed ledger that has the information that is uh, basically verified in a distributed fashion, which is on its own incredible. Uh, the currency is just one of the uses and uh, most of those um, second generation cryptocurrencies, let's call it this way, like the Ripple, like, um, man, I'm forgetting the names of those things. What's the second most popular one? Whatever, you get the idea. So they are actually not just the currencies, they are infrastructures for um, working with the distributed validated data, right? Ethereum, right, thank you very much. Uh, you seem to be very knowledgeable about all this stuff. <laughs> or maybe it's just me being bad and forgetting the names. Uh, so yes, uh, the thing is that you can use the blockchain underneath those currencies for not just transferring money, right? Or there's stuff like tokens, there's stuff like payloads, and there's a lot of very interesting things that you can actually build on top of that infrastructure. So do not dismiss them right away. This article is a very simple tutorial that introduces you on how to use the, uh, how to access the XRP using the Ripple lib, which I believe is official library from them. So if you are interested in trying your hand at blockchain and seeing what you can build on top of it and what you can actually do with it, then this is actually a very good starting point. I mean, you get all the basics like transfers and everything. Um, I don't think they explain contracting here, but uh, I believe it is covered in the library documentation itself. So again, if you are looking for, you know, getting into the whole blockchain world, then this might be a good starting point. Right, uh, that was enough embarrassment for me, let's move on. So we got the next article, it's called To Yarn and Back to NPM Again. And it's an insight from the uh, Mixmax uh, guys who basically moved to Yarn 30 months ago because of the problems that NPM had, right? So we didn't have NPM log, uh, Yarn was like 20 times faster. Since then, NPM has become significantly better. Uh, as we all know, NPM 6 is actually quite amazing and the audit feature is like one of the incredible things that Yarn still doesn't have. I, I'm not sure they will ever have it. So they look back at those 30 months and they mentioned the problems they had with Yarn. So I can um, relate to some of them. So like I never used Yarn Publish, for example, I always do NPM Publish. I don't know why I still install everything with Yarn. I am also annoyed by the fact that every time you, you run uh, Yarn on top of existing Yarn log, if it, it will try to run optimizations that will actually mess with Yarn log, so you have to recommit it to Git, which is uh, a bit not nice, right? And there's some like, yeah, bad regressions from time to time. Luckily for me, I didn't hit them because I was just not um, coding that intensively, basically, and did not update uh, to catch that regression, so I have the already fixed versions. And yeah, sometimes yarn lock is messed up again. I guess there was regressions as well, but uh, it, it can be annoying, right? So NPM 6 is way better. Again, uh, I mean, way better than NPM 5 and 4 were, but um, I don't know about comparing it to yarn. I mean, I'm still using yarn for the most of time, but it is faster, it definitely is still faster, but NPM is getting there. So like I've, I've used NPM in a couple of projects that I contributed to, they used the NPM as primary thing, so no yarn log, just uh, package log JSON, and it works quite good. So like I'm still, like one of the things that I like about yarn is that you get deterministic installs, right? So every time you run yarn, you will get exactly the same folder and uh, module structure as before. If I remember correctly, in NPM that was not the case. I think maybe with NPM 6 that was addressed because you now have this NPM CI thing that installs exactly the same thing from package log that was done before, right? So it should be deterministic, at least in theory. But I like this is something I need to check because if it now has the deterministic installs, there's not much reason left to use Yarn actually. Maybe there's, you know, like a, just a bit of a speed that it provides now, but. Uh, yeah, it's like it's getting better and better. So maybe we won't need yarn in some point. Um, but there are still some NPM drama coming up later. <laughs> later this podcast, we're gonna have a look at that. But yeah, um, there's also some interesting things like D yarn, for example, which I will cover in the library section. And a neat trick using the engines, you can actually enforce uh, saying, hey, you know, don't use yarn, please use NPM. 
which is pretty good. So if you are looking to move back from yarn to NPM or exploring that option, have a look at this article. There are some pretty interesting points. Right, continuing, we got to GraphQL, everything you need to know, which is just basically what you imagine from the title. If you are still unsure what GraphQL is, how do you use it? How does it compare to REST? How do you do data fetching? How do you do data mutations? How does caching work? And so on and so forth. Then this basically, this article sums all of that up into one nice article. And I've just repeated word article 25 times. That is, that is not good way to... <laughs> Something is not right with me today, but okay. So basically, if you're interested in GraphQL and want to know more, um, again, comparing it to all the existing things like, you know, REST and how does it do with caching and everything, this article covers pretty much all of that. So do have a look. Or maybe you need a refresher, right? So that's also a very good um, collection of resources to get up to speed to some newer developments, basically. Right, continuing. We got a, it's basically an opinion piece. Why is front end development so unstable? So, um, author here is looking into the stability, in quotes, of front end development, right? So, there's the, for example, here's the list of um, all the top libraries, most star libraries on the GitHub and their age, which I want to point straight out that this is actually not correct. So, React is, well, technically it is correct because first public commit on GitHub was three years ago, but practically actually React celebrated five years this week. So it is actually two years older, but you know, just because it was published and uh, shown to everyone, or I guess made public on GitHub uh, just three years ago, you could say it's just three years old, but eh, it's like, yeah. Um, and other argues that, you know, two and a half and three years is not that old. Um, it's like on one hand, yes, that is not that much. And if you look at something like jQuery is like 11 years old. If you look at like underscore or whatever, that's probably even older, right? Those libraries some like have crazy lifetimes. But on the other hand, when you look at React, Vue and all the others, and especially stuff like Angular that is like almost eight years old, um, and then think about the people who scream like, oh, JavaScript has a new library coming out every week. And well, as you can see, that is not exactly true, right? So all the, all the good libraries, all the ones that are hyped and that are used by communities, like primarily used by communities, like hype is irrelevant in this case, they're actually quite old, right? So those, none of this is like the new FUD. None of this is the new hyped up thing that is going to disappear. And this actually there's not that many projects that were heavily hyped and then disappeared in JavaScript world in the past five years that I can remember of, to be honest. So all of them turned out to be amazing, starting from React and going to Babel, going to Webpack, and you know we're still using that stuff and it's still good. Um, Arthur does mention a um, couple of valid things about the JavaScript and NPM infrastructure and NPM approach, I guess um, the modules approach in JavaScript world. The fact that if you are a junior developer, you will be kind of suffering from the whole um, oversimplifying or kind of over, how do you put it in English properly? Sort of trying to do only one thing with one module, right? So like the great example is like, if you want to use Express.js and if you want to parse JSON middleware, oh, sorry, JSON posts, uh, body, you actually need middleware for that, which is, I mean, it's kind of ridiculous, right? <laughs> and um, on the other hand, if you use more modern frameworks like Fastify, you don't have to do that. So they are like kind of have more sensible defaults, but still there are some things that are a bit too simple, too bare bones and still called frameworks, which is, I guess, kind of true, but uh, it is a valid concern, right? But what you could do is you could just stick to a more reliable things or I guess more um, monolith things like Next.js, like Vue.js that provides all the solutions out of the box. And this is exactly the sort of advices the author gives. Do not trust the medium articles that hypes things like, you know, self-promotion is obviously a problem. And especially when the authors do not um, disclose that they are actually the ones that wrote that framework and then go ahead and, and write a medium, medium article saying how awesome this framework is. I've seen more, more than one of those. That is not, not very nice. Um, always, please always disclose this. It's just 
you you have to know you are biased like come on <laughs> but yeah it's it's an interesting opinion piece and there's definitely some uh wisdom to be picked up from here all right let's continue so we got the javascript the curious case of null more or equal zero and if you try to execute that that will be true and uh this whole article is essentially a dive into the JavaScript spec that shows you that all of the sort of ridiculous cases that when you look at it first, you go like, why is this even a, a thing, right? So how does, why is this true? Why is this false then? Uh, the things that at first glance look ridiculous, but when you start to look into the JavaScript spec, you actually see that there is a very precise, very well written, very well described logic behind that. And if you just read the spec, you will know exactly what happens. So in this case, null gets casted to plus zero. And this is exactly why it is less than zero, it is more than zero. It is not equal zero, but it is more or equal zero because it is plus zero, right? <laughs> so it is a bit silly, but again, if you look at the spec it is very well described there so again and the same like goes for the more equal operator because it's a bit tricky too so you know next time you catch an error that you think like what is this weird thing just uh, try to look in the spec it might be very educating and very interesting to do so like i've spent a lot of time reading the spec just because i was curious why the hell that happened <laughs> Um, it might be very um, eye-opening, let's put it this way. There are some things that you would not know unless you actually read the spec. Again, not required. You know, you might might just evade edge cases like this. Although if you hit one, then spec is a good place to go. Right. Uh, continuing, we got a web worker driven Node.js. And um, just as you imagine, right, this is uh, basically... I guess it's it's more of a sort of a tutorial for the Workway library um, that provides you a socket-based Workway for um, addressing Node.js through the web worker, right? So you can basically expose the Node.js um, module to the browser through the web workers. This is how it works. And there's a very basic Express.js code here that allows you to wrap this Workway like this. What I think is interesting is that we're seeing all of that really interesting um, web worker code, right? That is now sort of polyfilled in some way within the Node.js. Uh, and it, it actually works as a load balancing. So you can actually load the four different cores of the CPU if you have them, right? Which is pretty cool. What I think is cool is that the last time we saw that there is a now work in progress within the node to add the Node.js workers, which essentially will be threads, which I think is going to change quite a lot of those libraries in a pretty significant way. So it is, yeah, if you are um, interested in the whole threading and worker space to have a look. Right, continuing, we got uh, progressive web apps with Polymer. So this is actually part two of building progressive web apps. There's a link in part one in here if you're interested, but I thought this would be interesting to highlight this article because it talks about Polymer. And I don't think I've actually talked about it yet on this podcast at least. So if you're not familiar, Polymer is a project from uh, guys at Google and it's essentially a web components based framework, right? So framework that provides polyfills, that provides nice abstractions to create uh, very cool apps, essentially, as the author here notes, in Lego brick style. So you have a lot of really cool components. And uh, let me maybe just go to it. Um, this basically is a tutorial on how to use Polymer, right? Uh, although I'm not sure. So the author talks about Bower here, which I know that Polymer used to use Bower, but I believe the last version actually migrated to NPM. They might not have finished that, but at least I've, I've read the announcement. So let's have a look at the Polymer itself. So where is the, why there's no link to Polymer project. So Polymer has a um, really awesome set of um, components. And like the website is, the website you see right now is made from those components. There was a link, where is the link to the component sets? Uh, App Toolbox, I think, was it App Toolbox? App router service worker. They have a lot of stuff now. Okay. <laughs> I have not checked out this library for, yeah, Polymer 3. There you go. This is what I want. Why do you show me the old one? Um, 
what did they put? They had a really awesome component library for Polymer that looked insanely good, but I cannot seem to find it any. Ah, web, no, no, web components is the core, right? So where is, doesn't seem like they have it anymore. Maybe it's just somewhere else. Why are you? Try Polymer, yes. Can I get, um, okay. Polymer guides, reference, ah, elements catalog. There we go, I found it finally. It's it's a bit hidden it seems. And yeah, as you can see, there's actually quite a lot of elements. And uh, the cool thing is that this is not, so those elements are not Polymer specific. They are actually web components that you can use anywhere, right? And there's this Polymer elements set of components that are absolutely amazing first of all they look really good um uh, there's a different set of them so there's like iron iron components that are very basic and there are i believe they were called like material components paper components right so this is basically material design components that are essentially the google style components right that you can just take and use um i don't know if there are demo somewhere here actually now, this is material design. It's not what I want. Overview demo. There we go. I probably blocked all the JavaScript here. Let me just do that. And uh, we should theoretically see. Yeah, there you go. So you got this toast. And you know, this is all the code that you actually need to write the toast. So it's, it's just one tag. And this is all web components, shadow DOM, and all that kind of stuff, which is pretty amazing. So if you haven't checked out Polymer yet, do have a look at that article. It gives you a nice tutorial. And uh, maybe you will like it more than React, Angular, and all the other stuff. Although, you know, you can actually use Polymer with um, any other framework because, again, it's just web platform, it's just web components. Right, continuing, we got yet another article from Observable HQ, guys. Um, last time I showed you that they announced the uh, way to import and export the notebooks as standalone components, essentially, JavaScript, compo JavaScript modules. So this time around, they actually wrote a tutorial on how to embed a notebook in a React app. So they wrote this notebook that has this nice animation, which, you know, looks very fancy. I think it's D3JS as usual. Um, yes, it is. Uh, no, it's just a canvas actually, okay. And then they show how to create a new React app using the create React app thing, right? And then how to download this uh, component or this notebook as a tarball. And then you can just, import it, right? Because it's just a module, which is kind of incredible, if you ask me. Again, very impressed by the work they do at the Observable HQ. And there's a very nice tutorial if you want to basically, you know, create a fancy animation and then import it into your own React app. I believe you should be able to do it more or less the same with Angular or whatever other um, framework you would like to use, right? Because again, this is just the JavaScript module in here. Right, continuing, we got building Redux from scratch. Um, exactly what you would expect from an article like this. Um, it walks you through the creation of your own tiny Redux library without you know all the crazy things that are happening in real Redux actually. Um, but if you walk through this, you will understand all the nitty gritty of the basics of Redux internals, meaning you know not the how to use it obviously, but how it works uh, because this is way more way more in-depth look, um, again, on a very basic level, but you will do all the dispatch, subscribers, reducers, middlewares, and all that kind of stuff. So if you're still at the point where you kind of use Redux, but don't know how it works, this is a really good article that explains all of that in quite in-depth. And again, you know, in a very simple manner, because Redux is actually a very simple concept, right? So, um, and there's cats in articles, so you can never go wrong with cats. Right, um, continuing. We got an example of how software becomes complicated. Essentially an article that says, okay, let's write a simple cache in JavaScript and see what it means to keep things simple, right? And um, again, yeah, cache is a simple thing, right? You set it, you remove it. It's just a key value store in this case. And then the author adds time to live and um, you can go through the code, you can have a look at how he tackles it, how he simplifies it, and what does it mean like to add complexity, right? So what I want to say from my perspective is that um, 
what what essentially the author done here is added a feature, right? So every time you add a feature to your library, to your app, to whatever, even if it's a tiny feature and you think, oh, you know, it's just gonna take five minutes, never underestimate the complexity it will bring to your app. So like, it can be uh, destructive, even even like I, I would even put it this way. So always be careful with adding new features to the things that you maintain, right? Um, yeah, there's just a few few words from me, a few painful, painful words. All right, continuing. And we got react and separation of concerns. Um, essentially a think piece again, or more of a, I guess, exploration piece than a think piece on um, seeing, you know, they're addressing the problem that a lot of people think that React actually violates separation of concerns because of the JSX, because of the component structure and so on and so forth. And the author just goes to explore how do you actually separate the styles, how do you separate the logic, and how do you separate the markup, right? And obviously, uh, I don't know, maybe some of you had those doubts as well that you know, JSX kind of breaks separate and react breaks separation of concern, and you have to put all, everything into one file. And this is not nice. And well, it's actually doesn't force you to do that. So you can actually do you can actually separate all of that into three different files and then assemble them into React component in one last file. We also have the higher order components pattern with the props pattern, right? Um, I, mean, I, I, for, I just keep forgetting the words today. How was the, what, what was the, is the like dynamic props pattern? What was the function as a child component? No, that was not it. We talked about this props pattern that is everywhere now last time or like two podcasts back and I already forgot how it's called. God damn it. But you know what I get. Render props. Thank you very much. God damn it. What is wrong with me today? Right. So, you know, we have higher order components and render props. Again, thank you very much. Um, so in my opinion, React is an amazingly flexible tool and you can do whatever the hell you want to it. Of course, you can just throw in everything into one component and that's what I typically do. In my opinion, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and then slowly separate it as needed. This is, in my opinion, the best approach because it keeps you flexible and fast enough uh, during the development. So yeah, it's a very you know good introduction. Again, if you never worked with React, there's some pretty nice uh, references to like glamours and style components and other approaches to styling and again, higher order components, render props and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, do have a look. Right, continuing. Oh yeah, this article is really, really cool. It's called UDC is one for everyone. Uh, UDC is one what? No, UDC is enough for everyone, right? Um, it is an article from a guy who creates a new calendar, right? Or I guess um, one of the team who works on a new calendar more than that. And there's a very big, very pretty article with a lot of really cool illustrations and GIFs in the background that talks about time, uh, not just in software development context, but also in the context of a world. There are some really hilarious stories here about time zones and about problems with time, right? So for example, this is something I did not know, but um, in Samoa, there was no December 30th, 2011. They just went from December 29 to December 31. It's like, I, I'm not sure why, but you know, it's a very fascinating story. So if that sounds interesting, do have a look at it because there's some really cool stuff in here. And um, this is not the only like silly story here. There's also like a story about Russians being late, late to the London Olympic games because of the different calendars used. So, you know, once used Gregorian calendar and the other used Julian calendar and the dates were like 14 days apart. So they were late for the Olympic games, which is incredible if you think about it. So um, obviously this is, you know, we're talking software development here. So it's not the only stuff that is there. So there are some silly things here about the time on its own, but there is also some things about how do you handle time in a software, right? Within a software, how do you handle events? How do you properly handle strings, dates, formats, and all of that? It is not easy, right? It's if you ever try to do even something as simple as this, you know, just say, hey, this thing was posted X minutes ago, or maybe a year ago, or maybe whatever. Like, I believe the authors uh, was working at the, um, 
GitHub prior to this, and this is one of the things that uh, they were working on. So this time uh, web component, uh, actually, yes, web component that is rendered with Shadow DOM and everything. And um, you would think it's very simple, right? But you actually need to provide a lot more contextual information to make it accessible, to provide the, like full day time for screen readers and all of that kind of stuff. There's also the thing with inputs, which is, yeah, that's still a huge problem. So like Chrome has this super nice daytime input, right? So you have a very cool calendar picker for dates, and then you have a very nice picker for time. And if you try to do the same in Safari, you will just get an input field. There's like, there's not even, there's no validation. There's no nothing. You have to type it manually, which is not very nice. So yeah, if you are interested in looking at the software development related to time, then this is a very cool article Do have a look at it. Right, next thing is called uh, redesigning metrics, uh, riot chat. So I've, I'm actually not sure about the metrics name. I haven't heard it before, but I know now riot chat. It's actually a really cool open source self hosted alternative to Slack, Discord, whatever you imagine. It used to be pretty jank, but it seems like they've improved. I mean, they've been developing it for the past two, three years, maybe even more, if I remember correctly. It's built on React, it's fully open source. You can just, you know, take it and use it within your company or for, with your friends or whatever. And uh, they've redesigning it. It looks very, very nice. Like the video for some reason is very uh, bad quality, but you know, whatever. It actually looks a lot like Discord now, which I personally like. I really like the Discord slick UI and this is in my opinion, a positive thing. They seem to have added a few more things that are like um, more Riot specific, I guess, which is again, a good thing. So you have direct messages within the servers, which is closer to the Slack than to the Discord. Um, I'm not sure which approach I like better. So like having one centralized um, chats or like direct messages, in my opinion, is better. But you know, if you have more, more than one company, and they have separate servers and separate chats, then it's kind of reasonable to separate them, right? So anyway, um, this is a pretty good look into the designing the whole thing, the philosophy behind it and so on and so forth. But I thought I would just take this as an opportunity to highlight the Riot chat itself. They also have a demo actually, if I believe uh, it's just like riot.chat, wait a second, where you can just go, no, was it riot.em? Yes, it was riot.em, there you go. So you can just actually go here and uh, give it a shot. I believe you can log in with um, GitHub as well, if I'm not mistaken. Is my sign in with something? Are you loading? I, I believe I was like logging in with the GitHub last time. Oh, okay, well, it doesn't want to work right now, apparently, but uh, there is a demo and you can have a look. And apparently you can even log into your custom server here, which is pretty cool. All right, continuing. Last time we talked about Jest 23 release, which I, you know, I highlighted a couple of features that I found posted on Twitter, essentially. There were no release notes at that point. Well, now there is. So <laughs> this article was posted like three, four days ago. And this is essentially release notes for Jest 23. So we already talked about interactive snapshot mode, which is really nice. Snapshot property matchers. Um, this is something I haven't seen before, which looks really awesome. And additionally, we now have this tiny, really cool thing. So you can actually use um, templates to generates a bunch of tests, right? So you can use this test each cases, and then you have expected passed in. So each of those values will be passed as expected to the, um, I guess each three of those values will be passed, right? So you can actually just generate tests like this. And it seems to be also working with template literals, which looks a bit weird, but I guess, okay. That looks kind of interesting, actually. I have to look closer at this, but that looks really cool. There's also some new matchers at it and um, you can have the, yeah, you can properly debug uh, hanging tests. This is something I actually didn't know about. So this is super handy. You can add detect open handles and Jest will tell you, hey, like, you know, you, you are not closing this server. This is why Jest is not exiting. I, I have more than one project that I was too lazy to basically debug this and the tests are not exiting completely because there's still something hanging. So I'm going to be using this for sure. 
Right, and there's some like watch mode plugins, which is always nice to have, some breaking tests and other minor improvements. Uh, you know, if you are interested in jests, which I, again, as I already mentioned more than once, I think my testing framework of choice, then have a look at this article. Right, continuing, we got the web application messaging protocol as the page test. This is a protocol, I just uh, found it interesting. I never heard about it, I thought I highlighted it. This is a WebSocket based sub protocol that is essentially combines two uh, patterns, um, RPC and PubSub, which uh, what I found interesting is that like, you know, both of those like sort of when you use WebSockets, you typically have to do both of those, right? And what I found to be cool is that there's plenty, so it's not just a protocol spec, some, some you know, thing in vacuum, there's actually quite a lot of already implemented libraries. So there's like Autobahn.js, for example, which is, um, okay, there is something, something went wrong here. Whoops, I probably, Autobahn.js, let's try to search it. It's probably on GitHub, right? Yes, it is on GitHub, there we go. Not sure why they link some non-existing thing, but uh, the library is on GitHub, it is, seems to be quite actively maintained. And you know, there is, well, there's a lot of issues, but I don't know, that doesn't seem like bugs to me. So if you are looking to work with WebSockets and don't want to implement your own pops up and RPC, this might be a protocol to have a look at. Um, all right, continuing. Yeah, we got, um, so this basically were major articles. So we got some additional minor things. First one being, um, there is a Chrome 67 released with V8, 6, 7, and we now have big ends right in browsers, right? So I can fire up the console and I can just say, okay, so I can just say number, max safe integer, right? And if I will be like, okay, plus one, plus two, plus three, you can see it's not reliable, right? So plus one and plus two yields the same thing. But now we have a big int support, right? Whoops, I screwed up. So we can say big int. We can wrap our max integer into big ints, and then I can say one n. So the n after number is how you denote big ints. And if you do that, you can actually see that it now works perfectly reliable, right? So this is a great thing. And 6.7 was just merged to Node.js. So it is now in master. It hasn't been released yet. As far as I know, there's been just, yeah, yesterday, basically. So it's gonna come, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure if they're gonna release the uh, new V8 version in a minor update, but we're gonna see, maybe there's not that many breaking changes. Still quite exciting times. We're gonna pretty, you know, there's gonna be some pretty crazy things happening with the big end inside of the Node.js, in my opinion, in the user land. We're gonna see where that leads. All right, next thing we got is the serverless next um, work in progress, I guess. So the idea is that the tight guys want to make next into dev only dependency, introduce next server and allow you to deploy your next apps in a serverless manner, which is pretty insane when you think about it and will be very awesome. So obviously there's gonna be like static things, right? I guess, but um, it is very like the, the, the way that the Next.js develops is still one of my favorite React-based frameworks. It's just insane. Every time, every major release, they come up with the things that just blow my mind. So I'm really excited to see where this actually leads. Right, continuing, I think this is uh, last or maybe nearly last article we have today. This is actually a really large guide on how to use Visual Studio Code. So if you wanted to give a shot to VS Code or if you just wanted to learn it a bit more in depth, this is a very, very big guide that walks you through just about everything you have to know about the core VS Code, right? So everything they have inside of the core, excluding the plugins. I mean, it does mention some plugins, but uh, mostly it talks about the core features and core crazy things that you can do like the integrated terminal, theme switching, extensions, debugger, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, do have a look at that. Um, again, VS Code is my favorite editor. Do have a look at this because I think it's absolutely amazing. Yes, there you go. So I was saying React uh, just had its fifth birthday on May 30th, um, which is kind of insane. Again, only three years old as a public project, five years old as a project within Facebook, which is, again, it's just crazy. They took two years to polish it for them, which just imagine this time, right? And Facebook dedicated resources to do that which again is pretty neat considering all the, you know, terrible things they do on the other side, they contribute to open source quite significantly. 
Okay, continuing. Uh, oh yeah, we have another NPM drama. Um, NPM sent 418 armor teapot to some people and uh, someone even opened an um, issue with a additional note. This is not a joke here. As it turned out, the uh, NPM proxy or I guess the front end was misconfigured and whenever you added the port to NPM registry, like um, where was, there was an example somewhere. So if you would add NPM registry and, uh, is there an example somewhere? Ah, yes, there we go. So if you added a port to the registry like this, for example, some proxies do that, right? When you do the HTTPS request, you got a teapot in response for whatever. I don't know who thought that was a funny thing to do, but it's, you know, for a company that tries to sell you service, this is slightly ridiculous, but all props to them. They fixed it quite quick. So it took like half of the day, I guess, for them to figure out what the hell's going on and fix it. Um, Nonetheless, quite amusing. All right. Um, yeah, that's the last thing we have, I believe. Um, this is actually a proposal I haven't seen before. And it's a proposed ECMAScript first class protocol proposal, which is essentially interfaces, right? So it's uh, protocols like you would see in Haskell, for example, I believe. But essentially, it is kind of like interfaces, right? So you, you have protocol definition, and then you can have a class that implements this protocol. That's it, right? And it is, the interesting thing is actually at stage one, which is, I'm even more surprised I haven't seen it before. So, you know, we are getting protocols in JavaScript, which is pretty great. I mean, I can see a lot of uses for that. And there's a lot of examples for, yeah, obviously functional programming, like, you know, functors and uh, monads and all that kind of stuff. Right, um, that's it for the articles. We are now at the releases section. There's actually been a lot of articles this time around. Not that many releases and um, quite a lot of libs and demos actually. But let's go through releases first. So we got TypeScript 2.9 with the major highlights being import types, pretty rendering by default and some additional editor features that are again VS Code just getting more and more insane. You can now literally extract methods to new files and it's just you know if you're using typescript and not using vs code you're probably doing something wrong <laughs> let me just put it this way right if you're a typescript person you probably already seen that if not then well i don't think there's any that features that are too exciting for non-typescript people in here we're gonna see what the 3.0 brings us or maybe 2.10 i don't know what the next one will be Anyway, pretty cool to see TypeScript developing further. It is uh, definitely one of the best typed implementations of uh, JavaScript. Um, there is another really cool project that I will show you today based on TypeScript. Let's continue. We got ViewRx version six. Um, RxJS support, or I guess RxJS based um, store for Vue, right? As you might imagine from version six, it added support for XJS six and simplified some things. Um, if you are working with you, highly recommend having a look at this. I've used it in one of the project. It was a very, very easy to set up and very neat to use. Again, I'm a huge fan of reactive programming and observables. You might be not, but uh, it allows for some really cool things. Right, uh, continuing, yes, Chrome 67. This is really big release. And as I said, they've added the big ins. And the other things are, first of all, desktop progressive web apps are now enabled by default. So you can actually have a proper progressive web app started from Chrome. So if you actually open, uh, we open, I believe, mobile, Twitter, right? So there should be a button here. Where's the button actually? There should be a button like save that as a progressive app. Did they remove it again? Wait, is that not enabled by default? Save pages. Wait a second, where's my button? Uh, blah, 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 additional breakpoints. If you have, be ah, okay. So there's the, the app itself have to fire the before install. Okay. So it's not quite, you don't really have that button yet, but they, during the testing, they had the button within the menu where you actually, actually no, pfft, let me try that again. Where you could actually just press here, you know, like create a desktop app. A shortcut is just a shortcut, right? What would even happen? Ah, oh, there we go. Open as a, yeah, okay, this is just a shortcut. That is boring. Um, all right. And we got actually a generic sensors API, which is also pretty neat. So you can actually have a sensors access from Chrome, like a gyroscope, for example, which is pretty neat. And I guess, you know, it's gonna be only useful on mobile, but still really awesome that, you know, we kind of 
less and less depending on the native apps and more and more things you could do with the JavaScript and progressive app apps, which we're going to talk a bit more during the demos section. There are some really awesome demos this uh, this week. I want to say this year. What is wrong with me? All right, we got um, next release is Cypress 3.0 and there's already 3.1 now actually. Um, so they've added the side task thing, which allows you to offload some tasks within Node.js and do like scaffolding, you know, database setup, whatever you want. And uh, yeah, there's like additional performance improvements, for example, for size screenshots that has been really, really, what is wrong with me today? Side screenshot that has been rewritten from the ground up and so on and so forth. I still haven't used Cypress. I need to do that at some point. It looks amazing. Once again, if you don't know what is Cypress, it is an end-to-end -end testing framework that looks just really good and really easy to use. Um, but yeah, right. Continuing, we got Verdaccio 3 released. I hope I pronounced that correctly. So um, if you are not familiar with it, it's a rewrite of Synopia, which is a uh, npm registry or community written npm registry that you can run locally that also acts as a proxy to npm so uh, we used to run synopia within the company i worked for um, the idea is really simple most of the corporate guys want to have some sort of a backup within their own network in case something goes wrong with npm or if they need to you know to close down the network and you only allow to do to work with the internal services so you run your own copy here. The way it works is quite simple. You can publish specifically to your own registry or you can pull in the modules from NPM. And if you install from NPM, if the registry doesn't have it, it will just proxy your request to NPM and then store the local copy there, which is, you know, quite nice actually. So if you are looking for a solution like this, have a look at Verdaccio. It seems, seems to be pretty nice. Also have Docker and Kubernetes images, which is always great. Right, next thing we got is uh, WebAssembly Pack version 0 0.30 uh, with additional features like proper logging this time around, no more emojis. That was a bit obnoxious, but yeah, I mean, it works, but you know, it's always nice to have proper logs here. Uh, if you're not familiar, WebAssembly Pack is the library to publish WebAssembly on NPM, which works really well. It is from Mozilla guys and a really cool tool. And, and yeah, it's really cool to see it developing. Right, next thing we got is Node 10.3, a minor update with upgrade to NPM 6.1 with uh, audit and audit fix and some additional minor fixes. And Jay Delton is, um, yeah. what is wrong with, okay, let me try this again. John David Delton is now collaborator in Node.js. Uh, you probably know him from his incredible projects like Lodash and ESM. He's been playing a lot with the ESM modules and adding them to the Node.js directly. I'm not sure exactly what he's working on within Node.js right now, but I'm thinking, you know, having him work there is always incredible. Like he's a very talented guy. Right, uh, next thing we got is Prettier 113. Um, highlights being like, well, I'm, you know what? I'm not gonna go through all of that because this change log is insane. And this is because all of those have subsections for nearly each of the languages. So there is, uh, I guess the highlight being the prettier works in browser now without any additional magic. So you just import it and it works. That's it, okay, great. Um, if you're interested in other languages and other things, do have a look at it. Uh, there's again, as usual with the prettier releases, quite significant improvements. Right, now we got to the libs and demos sections. We got, again, so everything that's left is basically libs and demos. As I said, there is JSConf EU and there's a lot of things released before it, prior to it and on it. So we're gonna walk through all of that right now. There's some really cool things here. So the first thing we have is a reach router. This is um, a React router for modern React 15 plus and it's an accessible router. So it actually is fully accessible, which is kind of insane. It has a really nice um, syntax as well. So the, the way that you set it up is really cool. Accessibility being, being the main highlights of it. And as, yeah, obviously there are some trade-offs compared to the React router. Um, again, you have to basically pick what you like more, right? Or what, I guess, what not what you like more, but what fits your project more. Let me permit this to... So we actually see what the hell is going on. And uh, yeah, it seems like a very nice project. Um, I have yet to try it, so I don't really 
have much to say it. I just saw it like two days ago, I believe, when it was uh, public or announced on Twitter, essentially. It's already a couple of releases since then, it seems. Um, re yeah, it's it's basically the slogan is next generation of rooting, right? So I'm gonna, gonna definitely play with it and see how it goes, how it compares to the React Rooter itself. Right, continuing, we got, yeah, this is the project that I am really excited about. It was just announced and presented on JSConf EU. Um, I think there should be a video somewhere on YouTube. I haven't seen it yet. I really hope they will publish it. So this is a project from Ryan Dahl, the guy who made Node.js, and it's called Deno. It is a secure TypeScript runtime built on top of VAJS using Golang. And there's a few interesting things about it. So first of all, it uses latest TypeScript and latest V8 available. And uh, it does not have explicit compatibility with Node.js. So it does not have NPM, it does not have any package JSON or anything like this. What it does have is support for modules. So what you can do is you can import from URLs, right? So this is how the AS modules work and this is what you do. The interesting thing is that if you work with the remote code, it will be fetched and cached on first execution and never updated it until you run it with reload flag, which is uh, quite interesting. Uh, it, it seems like, you know, the Golang approach because they have more or less the same um, thing going with the Golang libraries published on GitHub. But they're actually now reworking that with the versions because there have been quite a lot of problems with this approach. Um, other interesting things is that it's just one executable, right? Uh, the file system and network access by default is disabled and you have to explicitly permit it, which is also quite interesting. And uh, yeah, there's also stuff like, you know, dies on uncaught errors, supports top level await and aims to be browser compatible, which is also very interesting. So not Node.js compatible, but browser compatible and can be used yeah, to build your own JavaScript runtime, basically. Um, as you can see, you know, this is basically all the docs you will find about the project. It is in a very early stages, but by this description, it's actually really, really interesting and intriguing. So what this means is we can still use NPM through Unpackage, for example, right? Or through publishing our modules on maybe our own servers, which I guess is not as nice as publishing on Unpackage, but it is TypeScript, it is Golang, which means it's course platform by default, right? And um, I mean, it's, it's just fascinating. I'm, I'm really interested to see where the whole thing goes. Am I not? Yes, I'm not, I'm not lying, it's Golang. I remember I read about that somewhere, but... Uh, so yeah, uh, this is definitely one that I will be watching really closely and seeing how that develops because there are some very cool things in it. All right, continuing, we got servers. Uh, this is another insane project. This is a service subsystem for Linux, which is essentially a WebAssembly subsystem that runs in ring zero, um, ensuring safety and security, which is, I like I still, I'm, like, you know, I'm not, not the sort of crazy low level programmer who knows a lot about Linux kernels and stuff, but as far as I know, ring zero implies no safety and no security, right? So if you run something in ring zero and it's malicious, then you're screwed. This is at least my understanding of it. So I'm really curious to see how this develops and what kind of safety and security will they provide. Um, but yeah, so basically this allows you to run WebAssembly in ring zero and Linux kernel, which, which is crazy when you think about it. So we're gonna see how that ends up. Right, continuing, we got a couple of modules from uh, Google Chrome Labs, guys. Uh, first one, uh, actually developed by the developer, the guy behind Preact. Um, first one is the Webpack plugin for pre-rendering. So you throw it into Webpack and it will pre-render, meaning uh, pre-rendering, meaning process of rendering a client-side app and producing static HTML that can be just shown into browser without, you know, instead of bootstrapping the empty page, so sort of, you know, placeholders essentially. And this is literally all the setup you need to do, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. So it seems really neat. I have not tried it myself yet, but um, seems to improve the performance quite significantly. Again, really neat bit of tech, need to try it out. And the next project that goes along with it, again, from develop it from the Google guys, um, plug into inline critical CSS and lazy load the rest. 
So I imagine, you know, you pre-render the bits, you uh, inline the critical CSS and then lazy load the rest and you have blazingly fast pages. Again, setup is super simple. Right, continuing, we got, yeah, there we go. Uh, talking about awesome progressive web apps. This is um, JavaScript face detection and tracking library that basically allows you to do things like Snapchat filters. And there is a bunch of demos here. So there is, um, I'm not sure if it's a good idea to run this now, but let's give it a shot. I hope my webcam doesn't die. So I probably need to resize that and permit JavaScript in here. Uh, no, it's actually permitted. Where's my, I guess maybe continually. Yeah, so maybe, maybe the, my streaming software just captured the whole camera and I just can't actually, can actually do that. But do check out those demos. There's even the face swap demo that works really well. And, and uh, most of those work on mobiles. So it's like, it's really, really cool. And uh, I don't know if there's actually any GIFs of, of demos here, but it doesn't seem so. So do check it out. It's really impressive what you can do with um, JavaScript nowadays. And yeah, you can literally do filters and face swapping and stuff like this in browser. Even in, so I tried it on my Android and Chrome and it works pretty well. You know, not perfect, but uh, quite well. So yeah, WebGL and deep learning. Oh man, what a time. All right, continuing, we got Squip. Uh, this is something I think it's quite old, but I haven't seen it before. So I thought I would highlight it. It's basically a technique uh, for providing a low quality uh, image uh, preloading or placeholders um, based on SVG. So essentially you take the image and you generate this blurry version of it that will take just a few bytes. So in this case, as you can see here, 479 bytes, right? And then you show this preloading thing before you load the image. And like, it's a very known technique, right? So, but I didn't know that you could actually generate those SVGs with a simple command line. And the yes, like, it's, it's like, it's not even one kilobyte, right? It's like 479 bytes for a pretty large image, to be honest. This is really great. So if you're looking for, you know, place holding your images with something that looks user friendly, that this is probably the library to have a look at. And again, it's no JS based. Right, continuing, we got made a markdown driven task runner. This is a fascinating project that unifies or combines the documentation and code. The idea is that you install the mate command line, then you create matefile.md where you describe what you actually do. You define lint task that does eslint minus fix. You define build task that does babel source minus delib. And then you can define chains of tasks. And all of that is done with markdown. So if you actually open the mate file JS, is there a mate file in here? No, there is not. You would actually see that file as a documentation, which you can actually run which is, um, I really love that approach. So I have yet to try that again, just because I literally just found it like two days ago, but it looks pretty fascinating and, and really cool as an idea. All right, continue, whoops, that's yeah, not a button I want to press. Continue, we got X zero. Again, I believe not a new tool. Um, I think there've been a new release lately. It's um, Zero config, React development environment, and static website generator. The thing that essentially allows you to scaffold and develop components and websites in a very simple way with a lot of really nice uh, surrounding uh, tools, basically, you know, baked in with like hot reloading and all the stuff that you might need. So if you're looking for something like this, do have a look at the X0. Seems to be quite nice. And there's been quite a lot of updates actually lately. Um, so actively developed and everything. Version five already. So yeah, might be your thing. All right, continuing, we got dyarn, the tool that I talked about. I mean, it's not extremely complicated, so this is exactly what it does. It just, you know, handles your Git thing for you and runs the sanity checks and removes the yarn lock and everything. But, you know, if you manage a lot of projects then it's really nice to have something like this. Okay, next thing we got is a leg radar. Um, exactly what it says. So if you open the demo, you will understand what this means. You just introduce the lag and you will see that the radar lags, you know, more or less depending on color. Uh, I'm thinking that this is inspired by Dan Abramov's demo of React, uh, the asynchronous React thing, right? Because he had something like this in his video. So I'm thinking it's 
Yeah, yeah, it seems like, yeah, okay, he, the author even references him here, so definitely inspired by him. It's a really cool thing to have, basically, and a really neat testing tool. Right, continuing, we got Sucre's um, Babel alternative that targets modern JavaScript runtimes. So whenever you can compile for something that does not require you to have like, you know, EA 9 or 11 or whatever for compatibility, whenever you can compile for Node 8 or latest Chrome, this might actually be better and faster than Babel because, well, I'm, I'm guessing it just doesn't optimize us that much for old runtimes, right? So it can actually leave stuff like classes, imports, and so on and so forth, which makes it quite faster and quite simpler, right? So if you're looking for something like this, do have a look. There's plugins for uh, Webpack, Bay, uh, Gulp, and all of that stuff. So if you're looking for that, all this is here. Um, I'm interested to see how that will develop and whether it will replace Babel at some point. But uh, yeah, we're going to see how that goes. Right, next thing we got is Minipack. Um, this is actually a very simple example of how the modern module bundlers work. So it is a module bundler itself, but it is very, very small and very, very simple. And the idea is that it's actually supposed to be sort of a learning material. So if you, um, if you still don't understand how bundlers work or if you wanted to learn how bundlers work, this is exactly what it's for, right? So you just go to source mini pack JS and it's a very well commented code that just walks you through the whole bundling process and shows you how exactly it works. And there's literally just one file in there, which is kind of amazing if you think about it. Uh, so yeah, if you wanted to learn about bundlers, this is your chance. All right, next thing we got is PropyJS, a functional props composition for components. Um, it is pretty much library um, agnostic. So you can use it with React, React, Vue, Redux, whatever you can think about, even plain JavaScript. It is a library for combining props in a functional way. So, you know, if you have written functional programming, you would know what I'm talking about. If not, then, well, that might look a bit weird for you. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you are looking to work with a lot of props, then this might be the thing that you might look at. I, I have, to be honest, haven't checked it out completely yet because I've had zero time this week. Oh, my God. But it does look very interesting. So, again, with the render props pattern, it might be uh, even more useful. All right. Continuing, we got a subliminal. A VS Code theme uh, from Dan Abramov uh, from the React team. It's very minimalistic and very simple. And, you know, I personally like my material design theme. I like One Dark, I think it's called. And the whole, all the things around me, like I like the minimap and I like all the stuff. But I know that some people like the minimal style more. So if you think that this is more for you, then do have a look at this theme. There's additional tweaks that you would have to do to your editor, obviously. But uh, it looks pretty nice, actually. All right, continuing, we got this smooth UI, the React UI library based on styled components. Um, seems very snappy, very minimal, but, you know, like some really cool things, including model windows and everything. Um, minimalistic, but uh, pretty good looking, you know. So if you're looking for a small library based on styled components, which is which means the styles are essentially baked into our components themselves, right? then this is the one to have a look at. Okay, continuing, we got Embetti, uh, really cool library that is, um, it's essentially a wrapper for embedding tweets and YouTube videos without compromising user privacy, which is something, well, I achieved this using uh, Umatrix, right? Because I just blog the third party bonkers and they cannot track me. But like for, if you respect your users and guys at Heise Online obviously do, you can just run the embedded, it's have an embedded server, and then you just use the web component to uh, run the either tweet or a video. And it looks like the server will just preload it for you and then pre-render and insert the final HTML into the page, which works pretty nice, basically. Okay, then we got this small VS Code extension that I uh, found to be quite useful, uh, which is called Better Com Comments. It essentially highlights the comment based on what the comment contains with a different color, which uh, I don't know why the VS Code doesn't do it by default, but this is extremely useful, especially for like to-dos and important things. I've installed it for myself and found it quite damn useful. I don't know how I didn't see it before, but uh, yeah, this is a good one. 
Right, and the final thing we have is why do you open this to me? Please open the default. No, that's not what I want. Just open me the home page. There we go. Uh, so it's called code.xyz. It's an online code editor slash API builder for standard library. Although I don't really like the name that they've used and uh, the STD leave thing, which is, you know, it's actually kind of not true, but. Uh, if you've never seen them, this is essentially a way to build microservices with JavaScript. A pretty simple way, right? And they've created this code XYZ project that allows you to do um, API in your browsers and test them right away here as well, right? So you just click run and okay, you have to actually log in here uh, to run them, but you can run them, you can test them and you can deploy them all right from the browser, which is pretty neat. And uh, that's actually all I have to show for today. So if you guys have any other things that I might have missed this week or things that you might, um, things that you built maybe, things that you wanna show off or questions that you have, I will be more than happy to answer them. Um, and if not, we can just wrap the stream up over here. That was uh, quite lengthy actually. <laughs> I did not expect that would be so many news. All right, so I am waiting for the questions. And uh, if there are no questions within the next couple of minutes, we can just wrap it up. Let me do this. There we go. All right. So are there any questions? Yeah, thanks, Mikkel. Thanks for staying in stream. Thanks, my Patricks. Thank you guys always for, you know, coming here and uh, watching me talk about stuff and be terrible and Forgetting the words, thank you for reminding me about the blockchain, Ethereum, render props and all that stuff because apparently I'm terrible at remembering things. <laughs> all right, so doesn't seem like there are any questions. Thank you guys a lot for watching this. And if you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to ask your questions down in the comment section. Yeah, um, as usual, you can send your links that you think are really cool uh, on Twitch, on YouTube, on Twitter, on our Discord server, or in directly into the GitHub repo. I will be happy to accept them as issues or whatnot. So, you know, send them in any way you like. Your own projects are more than welcome. We'll be happy to look at them and cover them here. Thank you for watching and, you know, have an awesome weekend. And um, I see you next week. Bye.